And yes, we're on. So thank you again for, for joining us today. And as I said previously, we'll have three points of the, on the agenda today. And we're starting with the demonstration. Maxine, can you share the screen and start? Yes, with just, just give me a moment. I'm going to do sure. that while I'm organizing is this thing i'd like to also say that last time we had a, a discussion regarding uh, the design of fungible asset schema and we have not time even to get uh, to the end of uh, not of discussion even but uh, of uh, presenting what kind of challenges do we have for instance in designing the so First of all, we had some discussions since that time internally regarding the questions that we raised uh, last call. And also, I'd like to finalize this part. So after the demo and everything, uh, hopefully we will have time to go briefly to that. But yes, I expect that it might happen that we will spend more time on that and the usual question and answer. So we will have to postpone that part, uh, not on the next call, but we will have a latest discussion about Okay, so the demonstration. What I would like to do today is to start giving an introduction into uh, how, in fact, you can start using RGB today. Today, I would like to show you how you can run actual RGB related software and do such simple operations as uh, asset issuance and transfer of assets. I have to do a disclaimer that, in fact, by saying it's simple, it's not simple. Unfortunately, RGB relies, uh, in a big extent, on Bitcoin infrastructure. And it's not only about Bitcoin blockchain or Lightning node, it's very much also about key management. Because you do that commitments into Bitcoin transactions and you need to provide a local key, you need to publish those transactions, you need to do the signatures. And these parts, they are parts of normal Bitcoin related software wallets, they are done at the server side by changes, uh, payment providers. However, uh, it's really hard to do when you will try to play with RGB directly, not from inside a vault. So basically, if there will be a wallet developer and the change that will integrate RGB, your user experience will be simple. Here, with RGB, if you try to use it directly from outside of any wallet software, and as of today, there is no software that actually integrates sort of RGB, no wallets that have already integrated RGB, there, there, there's some work being done on that, and hopefully in some which we will be able to present that and do a demo with the wallet software, but as of today, there is no such software. So you basically need to manage all of that uh, Bitcoin related, non RGB, but Bitcoin related complexity with uh, your hands, which is really, really, really hard. So uh, I will, uh, well, it's not that hard, but it takes a lot of effort. So today I will be skipping this part related to Bitcoin network. And showcasing just the tools, uh, how to use RGB without uh, trying to do the actual signatures and publication of the coin transaction. Uh, this is for demo purposes, and at least you will be able to understand how it looks like and how it works like, and start some initial playing. And hopefully, within a few weeks, we will have uh, a first wallets or prototypes to integrate with RGB. So, uh, today basically the version that I'm going to present, I will start screen sharing. Uh, the version I'm going to present, we code named this version as uh, uh, beta one. Um, why beta one? Because it's the first version that integrates uh, the whole uh, stack of RGB functionality and um, well, that's why, but it's still not being audited uh, thoroughly by the community and not used anywhere yet. So basically that's sort of definition for beta. 
where to take the code. Right now, there are two main sources. If you need to run RGB node, you need to look into RGB node repository. It's here. And uh, you see my screen, right? Yes, you see it. And also, the RGB node software uh, is based on Rust and PBP library. Rust and PBP library implements all the primitives that are required for RGB and contain all consensus critical and verification validation critical code. This LNPBP core library is more than just a simple RGB backend library. Additionally to RGB, it implements different parts like Lightning Network protocol, different enhancements to Bitcoin protocol, the paradigms that RGB is based on related to client-side validation, single-use seals, and so on, which may be used by some projects outside of RGB. So basically, this is the most important part, and, basically, and we will be focusing on further audit of this part with moving towards uh, while well, we were moving towards the release right now we have a code coverage of 30 percent of the uh, whole library uh, and hopefully over the next weeks we will be able to bring that more than uh, at much higher levels uh, but again you wouldn't need to use this library directly what you need to do is to download your rgb node and sdk from github and uh, compile it. We have some compile instructions. I wouldn't be spending time on that. This library contains uh, the RGB node, the command line tool to work with that RGB node, and also uh, different integrations related to iOS, Android, Node.js, uh, which allow you to use the RGB functionality from inside your software. As I was giving a talk on integration of RGB, this is basically a repository you're integrating with, and this is node is built in a way that it can both, you can use it for running a full-fledged server-side node with a multiple processes in Docker containers, with a, an elastic environment where you scale different instances of different daemons, or on your notebook as a single daemon with multiple uh, threads, or in mobile wallets as a threaded uh, RGB uh, thing that is basically embedded into your application. So depending on the integration you are using, you use the same repository, the same code base, uh, but you can integrate it in, in different ways. Today I will be uh, showcasing you how to use the RGB node as a daemon and to call different functions from command line, because basically as a voice, you, you can't use it without developing the wallet itself. Uh, okay, so here we have the code. Uh, if you will be checking out, I ask you to check out the beta one release because uh, the, the development is happening in master branch. We have a target that the master branch uh, should be always uh, compiling, but we call, you see these green flags uh, that it was compiling well, but because uh, some, it's still a development, uh, something may break up, uh, and that's why it is recom recommended to get into releases and download beta one, either as an archive or go to a tagged version for the release. Uh, also, I would like to point out that we have integrated a, a continuous integration system uh, with GitHub, so each build is uh, tested against multiple environments, uh, which hopefully will help us to maintain uh, the stability of the further development of RGB. So uh, now I need to switch the screen to go into the command line. Give me just one second. I think I don't need to give a disclaimer that this is a first de demo and something can go not as it was expected. And so hopefully uh, I will be able to demonstrate all the all the functionality I, I tried to, uh, I planned for today. And I will be giving an explanations about different parts of RGB itself and software and file formats and data pieces while I'm doing the demo. So uh, when you install and download the archive, we are already in the repository 
uh, directory containing all of that code that we just put on uh, GitHub. And uh, you need to install a number of dependencies. It's all in readme file, uh, like SS open SSL libraries, zero message queue library, and others. You just follow the instructions depending on your environment. The system works on Ubuntu, on Windows, on Mac OS. So it's completely cross-platform from day one. And also on Android and the iOS. Uh, and uh, to, uh, as a final step, you need to run an instruction to install the actual software locally. So this is done with the carbo install command. You need to provide the path source path for the repository. And carbo install um, creates all the binaries. There are a few of them, and I will be explaining uh, about each one of them. And these binaries are basically installed into your path location, again, depending on the operating system you're using. So you will be able to call them directly from uh, from the command line without going into this uh, directory. Uh, you see that basically it compiles the latest version of LMPDP library and the actual RGB node. Another important uh, note that I have to do is that RGB, of course, keeps mm -hmm. some data. And as you know, with the client validation pipeline, you don't just don't need to access uh, blockchain only, you also need to keep uh, a lot of data locally this client validated data. And that's why you need to specify a storage. RGB node is built in a way that actually it, can, it has a storage drivers. Depending on the environment where you're using RGB, is it mobile phone or server, you may have a different storage drivers. For instance, you might store some data in very efficient um, uh, NoSQL uh, key value databases. Uh, or you can get, use just a file storage uh, that allow you to do that in a simple way. Right now, RGB is equipped with this file storage driver. And when you, whenever you start any daemon, you need to provide uh, the information about location on disk where the data uh, will be stored. Uh, so uh, the RGB consists of a set of that daemons. You can run all of those daemons with a single command, RGBD. However, here, for the purpose of demonstration, I will run different instances of different demons and different command line consoles, so you will see the output and will understand what happens where. Uh, I will start with uh, the first demon called stash, stash demon. This is the demon responsible for keeping all the client validated data for all possible RGB contracts that you have. And you will always have a single demon per, uh, per stash. Basically, what is the stash? The stash is all assets, all contracts, all identities, everything that you might own. And also, uh, why you might have different stashes? Because basically, stashes is responsible for managing uh, the state of assets. And if some of the assets are located into a lightning channel, you wouldn't be able to, do, to transfer those assets uh, using a normal uh, way of transfer outside. That's why, basically, each Lightning channel has a separate RGB stash behind it. And normally, with the wallet software, you will have uh, a single stash for your on-chain assets and one stash for each channel that you have. And these stashes are basically used to separate uh, different assets from each other, so you occasionally wouldn't move the assets that are inside Lightning channel. Uh, well, you, you wouldn't be, a, it, this will basically invalidate like the channel itself uh, and fail the channel. So that's why it's important to keep them separated. And also, uh, each stash is basically backed by a single stash daemon. It, it's pretty much similar to C Lightning architecture when you have a single daemon per channel and so on and so forth. So I will start the stash daemon. And uh, in order to do that, well, it, it has a set of parameters, you can list them. And in order to do that, you need to start it, you need to provide it with a data directory. So I will do that by hand, stash daemon, data directory. I am using a local path, the data directory right in the, inside the repository. It creates everything that it needs. 
And also, I would like to provide a verbose flag, so I will have a lot of uh, debug information being present on the screen. This can be done with verbose flag. I just specify four of them to see everything that happens. And it basically instantiates all the storage drivers and waits for a connection. I will clear the screen so you will be able to follow the input. Uh, the second daemon that we have to run is the daemon responsible for fungible asset management. Because as I said, RGB can run multiple types of contracts backed by different schemas, like fungible assets, but additional to that, that can be a collectible, non-fungible assets, some audit records. And each type of the uh, schema basically requires a daemon that will be managing uh, schema-specific uh, information and present this information to the wallet or the software that uses uses RGB. The fungible daemon, daemon is called fungible. Uh, again, it has a set of uh, set of parameters. You need to specify a data directory, and also we will use a verbose output. If you will try to use, run it without uh, data directory provided, it will be saying that it can't access the cache data. So we will do the verbose flex and path to the data directly. Here we are. Uh, so I, I can only yeah. see the, the, the previous window with, uh, with the stash daemon. Uh, maybe you have uh, it in the Yeah, the, the, the demo works. The, the, the presentation probably requires to share the whole screen. Yeah, now you see when I switch between the windows, right? Not yet. No, I see nothing for now. Let's see if yeah, it's... Huh, strange. It shows me that it is being demonstrated once again. Do you see anything? No, blank screen. Hmm. Strange. Let me reconnect. Sure. Mm -hmm. As always, it's never about the content of the demo, but about the infrastructure around it. So we can see the screen now. You, you see the screen. And when I switch between different windows, do you see it? Yes. Yeah, now we can see both windows. Okay, so I was demonstrating that I run the fungible daemon with this command providing the data and it's instantiated uh, asset manager, which is schema specific part of RGB functionality. And again, there will be a single daemon per schema per stash. Meaning if you have a multiple assets, but all of those multiple assets under the same fungible asset schema and in the same stash, you will run just a single instance of this daemon. And these demons are interconnected, like C Lightning. They are all integrated with each other using this LMP protocol. And uh, the API, they can run over different types of connections. If you are using them on mobile phone, uh, they will be just uh, uh, threads having, having some shared memory. And they will use direct memory access to each other. And no encryption, of course, just to for performance uh, purposes. Uh, but if you run them on a server, you can run them on different geo-distributed servers, and they will communicate over TCP connection. Or you can use local POSIX socket, or you can use a zero message queue backed uh, socket. So it's all done at the level of Lightning Network protocol. And those who are interested, uh, we had a presentation about how this protocol allows uh, such microservice architectures and their scalability and also end to end encryption. So you're all welcome to check that presentation. Now, Finally, I'm moving to command line tool. The command line tool called is uh, called RGB command line CLI, like a Bitcoin CLI and so forth. And uh, again, you're also, because you're running locally, you have to provide it uh, with a path to the data directory. And here I also will uh, help you how to find what are the possible commands that you can execute with command line utility. First of all, it's help command, which demonstrates what uh, 
high level commands are possible. I will provide a data directory and use a fungible subcommand. With fungible subcommand, we have also different subcommands. Uh, and I will go one after one. I will start with the simplest one, which is basically list. So if I do an RGB clear uh, fungible list, it will return me a list of known assets. Right now, I have a single issued asset, uh, which I named COVID uh, after the hype uh, around pandemic. And um, with the, 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 the list common has also its own arguments. So I can do a help list, for instance. And I will see that I can specify a format of the information that I am presented with. So for instance, I can say that I'd like to see it's in the JSON listing. Sorry, I don't need help part anymore. That's a JSON, so now it's JSON. Or uh, I can use YAML as, as by default. So you can basically parse that output if you need to. And also you can use a long way of listing with L flag or long flag and also in json it will be easier so here you will have a more information about even the allocations of the asset if i put that in json that will be easier to platform to parse uh, into yaml sorry yeah so here you will see that for this asset with this id uh we have this information general like ticker ticker name and so on supply known supply uh, and total supply it's just a hundred of assets uh which network it is issued on fractional bits date of the issue and so on and so forth uh we have a list of known issues so there are, if there are multiple issues there will be a multiple s uh, entries with a supply for each of them and list of known allocations basically allocations that we do own and each of these allocation is related to some specific bitcoin transaction output and of course it keeps the amount of assets plus information about the blending factor because basically this is bound is seen only to the asset owner meaning the person that has the blending factor and we do when we do a transfer this information is got hidden and instead of that you will have a Pedersen commitment and you wouldn't be able to see what how much uh, it will how much of the asset was owned uh, by the previous owners so uh this is general informational comment uh, now i would like to start from the very beginning with the asset issuing comment yeah, there is some question. Hi, thanks, Maxim. Hi. I'd like to Hi. know if if it's possible to can you create the behavior in an asset where you can re you, you can issue an asset once, and you can burn that asset. You can remove the the supply of that specific asset, but you cannot reissue again. Yes, uh, we are still discussing the procedure for burning an asset. And actually, I would like to refer you to our previous call, previous week call. And we spent a lot of uh, time discussing how the fungible asset schema is working like, how the multiple issuances are working like. There are a way to control. Uh, would, should you be able uh, to reissue the asset or not? And how many times and up to which total supply? And it can be managed in many, many actual details. With a command line tool, uh, it's not everything. Oh, I, I haven't put, spent my time putting all the functionality into command line tool because I, I don't. I doubt that every, anybody will be using it from command line tool. They will be using Wallace and special software. So right now you can do just a single issued asset, but uh, again the, the the functionalities are in RGB node and using by using an API and integrating into the wallet. If the asset, uh, well, when you issue the asset, you define should it be reissued or not, and. Uh, basically you will be able to control and have information about the issuance as a user of the asset. Does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. So let's proceed with the fungible asset issuance command. Uh, if we don't provide any parameters, we get small help about which pro parameters do we need to provide. So we need to give some ticker. Let's say that it will be, I don't know, use the tether. Uh, title mm, and the allocation. 
Uh, additionally to the, those parameters, uh, I will clean it up and see you some help with more details. Because basically, additional to these parameters, you can provide an optional description, you can provide a dust limit, you can specify that asset should be inflatable or not, actually what the, the, related to the question that you just asked. And you can specify the number of digits after the fractional part. So like in Bitcoin, you have eight digits, um, the difference between Satoshi as a small unit and Bitcoin as a large unit. And you can also define a limit of total supply, which is only used if you create an asset that allows a secondary issuance and inflation. And additionally to ticker and title, you need to provide a set allocation, meaning which Bitcoin spend transaction output will hold uh, the asset that you just issued. And this allocation is provided in this form, amount uh, at sign some particular transaction ID and specific output inside that transaction. So uh, I have some transaction in place, which I do own over the test network. Just give me a moment to copy it. Uh, so let's do it. Let's do an issuance. Issue USD T USD Tether uh, with a million of assets assets, 1 million at this specific transaction output. Sorry, I already inserted the number of assets twice. Yeah, this is transaction ID and output zero. Also, I would like, mm, would like to, well, let's use it as it is, yeah. So we've got the asset issued. So if we will look into the output of the different demons, we will see that it records each of the RPC calls. And here we got the issue call with uh, all these parameters that we just provided and default values for those we haven't provided yet. Uh, the transaction output, amount of assets, and so on and so forth. And this data are basically passed up to the stash daemon uh, so fungible daemon transforms the request from asset specific request into generic RGB form validating against schema because again at level of uh, core RGB you don't have such a concept as your asset coins you have just a, a state which is assigned to different transaction outputs and here you will see that uh, you basically create a genesis of the asset under some particular schema. This this is this fungible schema ID uh, in a test net uh, with a, some metadata, specific asset and schema, uh, fungible asset schema specific metadata. And those metadata include also a total supply and so forth. And assignments, assignments to transaction outputs, which are using homomorphic encryption. And uh, this is information about the transaction we are assigning the state to. And uh, when we issue a genesis, we get this identity of genesis. So if you issue some asset, you may copy this ID, send it over to somebody else, and uh, this person will be able to import this asset using the, uh, this information. So with the RGB CLI, we have a comment for importing. And if you will provide the uh, information about asset, you will basically import it on some other instance of RGB. And this uh, this encoding using back encoding is quite small. I wouldn't say that it will fit into tweet always because it will grow with the more allocation you provide and more description you provide, it will grow with that. Uh, but basically it's still quite small to be sent over uh, messaging or in any other way. And if we will look into the data directory uh, where we keep all the data, you will see that, uh, I will go with them, MC. We will see that uh, here in the data, we have a subdirectory for each network. In this case, it's a test net. We have sockets via which uh, the demons are connected. And we have a directory for stash. There might be a multiple stashes, as I said. So the main chain is called default. And different data, including 
Genesis. So these are the raw data of the Genesis for each of the assets, and they named after the ID of the asset. So this is actual ID of the asset we will be using. If I will exit from here, I will probably show you how it looks like in hacks format. So this is uh, Genesis of the asset. You see the title and other information here. And if I will uh, list assets that I have, I will have these IDs. Basically, these IDs, they uniquely identify the asset. And Genesis is actually allow you to import all asset information that is required. So they are different, Genesis and the asset ID. Now, let's move to the asset transfer. And uh, to, to, in order to make a transfer of some asset, of course, we need to know where we held an asset. And we have this information from what we just, uh, from the asset uh, creation. We know that we have a million of assets at this transaction output. So this part is present. However, additionally to that, we need to provide a lot of other things, which may be provided by a wallet software, any Bitcoin wallet. Uh, however, uh, it's, it's quite hard to provide them from the command line. Uh, so right now the transfer command looks the following. Transfer. You hit. You have to provide an invoice which will contain the information uh, from the party you would like to pay to. And this basic information primarily should be about which transaction output you need to send asset to. Also, you have to provide a prototype of the transaction in form of a partially signed Bitcoin transaction because you need to embed a commitment to this transfer procedure into a witness transaction. And this transaction, it's, it's really recommended not to create a new transaction each time, but to uh, use some of the transactions you normally generate and just put commitment data into that. But of course you can create a transaction. And the creation of transactions, Bitcoin transactions is quite hard to do from a command line. And there is no point of embedding that into a tool designed for RGB. So the idea here is that you can use Bitcoin Core or other wallet to create and draft the Bitcoin transaction. Uh, and then export is as partially signed Bitcoin transaction and specify as a file here. I have one transaction at place. It's in test directory. It's called source uh, transaction, Bitcoin transaction. If I view it in a hex format, you will see that basically the, the partially signed Bitcoin transactions, they are binary. So this is a bi binary data. It's, it's hard to draw any information out of here, but it's normal format, the partially signed Bitcoin transaction format supported by Bitcoin Core. And I will need to use it as a prototype. Uh, then I also have to specify a fee because this is this transaction is not published yet and uh, while creating it I, I, I have specified a fee in Bitcoin Core basically and it's not saved by Bitcoin Core and partially signed Bitcoin transaction format so I have to provide it manually. I also uh, need to specify uh, unspent transaction output which I own where the change uh, will go to. So if I wouldn't transfer all of the assets that I know, I need to keep the assets for myself. So basically I have to provide with this change output. And uh, the final two parameters are two output files. One of them is where to say the partially signed Bitcoin transaction containing the commitment to this transfer operation. And the other file is consignment. Consignment is an RGB structure that contains all client validated data required for asset ownership. And uh, this is a single file, again, binary. And uh, this is, these are the data you need to transfer to the P payer, to receiver of the payment. And this payer have to import them into their own stash. Of course, you can do it via file transfer, like here I will be doing in the demo. But when you will be integrating this functionality into to wallet, I assume that wallets will operate establishing a networking connection and sending this data over the network. We also, on, on a few calls, we were describing the idea of Bifrost server network. It's a public server network. Uh, 
pretty much like uh, Lightning Network watchtowers. So if your receiver is not online constantly, he can use one of public uh, before servers, provide you with his public key, and you will just encrypt this consignment uh, data, send it to Bifrost network, and he will be able to grab them later and import uh, the information about transferred asset into his wallet. So let's do the transfer operation. Let's start. Oh, yeah, we need an invoice. So first we have to generate invoice. And for that reason, we have a special invoice command, uh, which also have its own, has its own parameters. Uh, to generate an invoice, you need to specify identifier of the asset you would like to create an invoice for. So let's do an invoice for use the tether. This is the ID that we need. We are copying this ID. And the second part is that we need to say how much of the asset we would like to receive. Let's say we are hungry and we would like to receive a million of assets. The final part is that you need to provide a transaction outpoint, unspent transaction outpoint owned by you, which you can spend in the future because basically this transaction outpoint controls the spending of RGB asset. And um, again, uh, I have some transactional point at hand. Just give me one second. Here it is. Uh, help again, I, I forgot to remove the help word. And the invoice is being generated. Now, I need to provide more information how, about how the invoicing thing is working, especially about why they do need this output blending factor and so forth. So the idea is that RGB is built around uh, concept of privacy. We would like to have the system that keeps and preserves the privacy as much as possible. So when you ask somebody to send you assets, you are not providing them with the transaction Bitcoin transaction output you own because it is basically a confidentiality link. You hash this Bitcoin transaction output uh, with uh, some uh, random data entropy. So the, 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 it is impossible to create rainbow tables and decode what transaction output you actually own. So the payer doesn't know when he does the payment uh, which transaction output you had provided. And this is hidden form of transaction output is actually present in the invoice itself. Uh, however, when you receive uh, the payment, you need to be able to show in the future when you will be spending this asset, the proofs that actual uh, output had, a cont had, con had contained uh, asset. And for that, you need to provide this seed, uh, so this blending factor this random value that you use to do the hash. And while you are not sending this hash, this uh, entropy to a pair, it's not part of invoice, you, might, you must keep it locally and you must of course remember the transaction output that you have provided in order to import the asset into your stash when you get this consignment data. So we will come to that later. The second point, the original design of RGB and actually the present design of RGB contains a possibility to assign this asset, this transferred asset, not to existing transaction output point, uh, but to one of the outputs of the transaction you are creating for the commitment. The transaction which we will be creating with this transfer procedure and transaction taken from this partially assigned Bitcoin file. However, uh, the interesting point is that uh, this transaction output, in that case, must be controlled by the party you are paying to. And this transaction out point, uh, output must also contain some bitcoins additionally to assets. So first of all, uh, you will be able to spend it when you need to spend the asset and also you'll have to have the ability to hide it, the, the fact that it's just uh, RGB output. 
uh, from chain analysis tools. So it has it has to have some normal amount of bitcoins, which would work, look for any on chain analysis tool. So okay amount. And th in this case, it basically means that you have the payer that creates this payment. They also need to transfer you some bitcoins, which uh, and while RGB allows to do that in a user story format. Uh, if you would like to get uh, the essence bound to the transaction output uh, of the commitment transaction of this witness transaction, you have to provide the payer with your public key, which is again a safety leak and confidentiality leak, and additional input to spend some of your Bitcoins back to yourself. And basically that complexifies the protocol so much that right now in the command line tool, I haven't put this functionality. It will be present in Bitcoin wallets, but it's meaningless of having it here. And I actually really doubt that this workflow will be really useful or wallets will be interested in implementing it. So I would like to hear your thoughts on that. And uh, do, 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 you, do you think that we need to get rid of this uh, procedure at all from RGB? Because each procedure just makes the things more complex or not. Okay, so now we have an asset and we have an invoice, sorry. And this invoice is done according to the proposal created by Alecos on invoicing format. However, there is a few, there, there are a few questions I would like to raise right now. Well, the, uh, this format will basically follow the uh, BIP uh, 32, if I'm no, not 32, which one defines the URL for Bitcoin addresses? Alecos, are you here? 21? Yeah. I think, yeah. yeah, 21, sorry. Yeah, 31. So basically we provide uh, an RGB20 prefix. Why we need 20? RGB20 is a standard for fungible assets. And of course, invoice is something that is asset specific, schema specific and not generic for all RGB protocol. Then we provide with this encoded out point, basically the transaction output uh, has together with this entropy data presented in back format. Then we provide information about the asset ID that we actually have to use uh, and we are asking to transfer and amount of assets we are asking to transfer. Uh, that the idea for on-chain uh, RGB transfers. However, what I would like to propose is to reconsider this standard once again and maybe use a more a single batch encoding because here we have a several batch encodings right inside the single stream and it looks really confusing also when i will be doing transfer this sign used by urls format will not work from command line and i have to manually replace it otherwise uh, the stuff wouldn't be working which is again not very useful so a single back 32 encoding like used in our lightning invoices looks more reasonable from usability point of view, at least at this stage for me. But anyway, let's do a transfer. Okay, let's help uh, see the help with the parameters. So first we'll provide an invoice here. Then we provide uh, a prototype of the transaction. It's in test directory, uh, source click space bt file. Then we need to provide information about fee. It's one Satoshi in this test case. We need to provide a change address. We would like to receive the change to. Let's copy, let's copy it. Just give me a second from other screen. This is the asset change, right? The asset change, yes, correct, the asset change. Here it is. Uh, then we need to provide a file, a consignment file. We would like to save, inf save information to. So um, again, I will put it into test directory, consignment USDT. There are a few files that I already created, but not this one. Uh, RGB extension, let's use it. And uh, partially signed uh, output transaction format. So, um, it seems that we have all 
let's see how it will the procedure will go through all the demons that we have i would say that it will go, not go through and i will explain why you see we have some strange behavior that is because of this invoicing format so i have to change this uh, sign here uh, you can use quotes around that oh yeah yeah that's that's another possibility actually so now Yeah, we I, I have specified a wrong amount of uh, the asset probably somewhere. Because right now the, the, the changing functionality is not uh, working as I was expected. So we have a million of assets, million of assets. Oh, sorry, I'm running, doing a wrong asset. So I'm using this asset from, it says ID one, yqq and this is previously issued asset which i only have a hundred of so if i do once again a fungible list and we'll use a long format i will see that i have the COVID asset i have a COVID asset with this id yqq not like 76 and the use the tether assets and i have different amount of them so i have just uh, i have a million of use the tether and just a hundred of uh, that one so let 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 do me once again i will just copy uh, the command that works i know it works well so it will be easier to do that then regenerate everything so fungible transfer uh, oh, yeah, I forgot to specify an import. I assume that that was the reason why the command failed. I can specify multiple inputs to the commands for, command for sure. And here I'm using the uh, issuing input. Yeah, now transfer has re worked, transfer successful. Consignments are set, saved to these two files, and here I will see that a lot of stuff has happened at the back end. So uh, the fungible uh, daemon has generated, has proceeded the partially signed Bitcoin transaction. You see that it parsed the information, it tweaked the scripts, it uh, have um, checked everything around, and uh, stashed have created the proper state transition and anchor data, uh, compressing that into a single consignment format. So we will have a special session getting into all the details of how this is actually working, what are these transitions, anchors, consignment, and so on. The most important that now we have this witness PSBT file with a, a tweaked, uh, with a tweaked uh, transaction. And we see that it even have a different length because we have provided, we, we, did, we do not change the length of Bitcoin transaction, but we add some metadata to partially signed Bitcoin transaction format for the wallet that will help uh, the wallet to use this uh, in actual preparing the actual transaction for Bitcoin network. And we have a consignment USDT file, which actually contains all the data that are specified to our use detailed transfer. It, it contains the genesis, because if uh, the receiver doesn't know the genesis, he wouldn't be able to accept it. And you see the parts of genesis data here, USDT, USD tether, and the information about the transfer. This interesting part, this consignment has a size of 464 bytes, and it basically contains two transfers, the genesis and the, the transfer. So we can now use this data to estimate how the size of off-chain data will be growing. We will do that after the demo. Now, we have, a, we have this consignment file. Let's uh, imagine that now we are receivers and we would like to receive and process this data for that we have to do uh, another command of course which is fungible accept um sorry just one quick thing yeah i think you forgot to uh change the asset id 
So you basically ran the same command as before, just with the input. No, no, no. That, uh, that is was correct. You see, the, the both of asset IDs, I just checked that here. Oh, they are start correct. With this yeek. They differ in this part. No, oh, okay, okay, only perfect. Sorry. Six and EMG. And here we have a ye okay. MG. So it is so it was already driver. correct. Okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. yeah, it was already correct. If I will try to change that, and I need to use some other witness output just in case. If I will try to check uh, change the asset ID, the invoice wouldn't actually pass through. But let's let's try to do that. Let's see how it will work or not. Uh, because of the amount in this case, because you don't have enough. Well, let's check. That's interesting. Always interesting to see the, does the thing work as expected or not. Yeah, input amount is not equal to input. Yeah, because of the amount in this case. Right. Uh, but also it will fail because it wouldn't fire at the later stage if I will correct the amount, but it wouldn't find the required amount of the asset uh, of this type. Uh, okay. So let's say, let's accept that transfer. So we have some help about this comment. We need to provide with a consignment file, which is test uh, consignment uh, USDT RGB. Then we need to provide it with uh, outpoint and blending factors. So these are two which we used for creating the invoice. Uh, that's why we need to keep them. But again, it, it wouldn't be the user need to keep this data. It, it will be a wallet software which will be managing and keeping all this data. So when you create the invoice, the wallet should save those in information. So I'm trying to find out where it was. Not here. Mm -hmm. Create an invoice. Yeah, here, blending factor and uh, transaction output that I used. So I will keep first blending uh, transaction output and then blending factor. Again, I need to it. Uh -huh. Here it is. Let's do it and see what happens in the server part. Accept transfer successfully happened. So now we see that actually we have taken this consignment containing all the Genesis data and also Anchor, proving that Anchor is basically built of two types, of two parts. First, this multi message commitment to the to, to the state transition procedure. Here we have this commitment with some entropy for hitting the information and a proof about that the commitment is actually present in the witness transaction. Uh, this proof contains the original public key and also additionally to Anchor, we have a transition information specifying from which points we do transfer from which Right now, this is a genesis, but from which previous transfers we are doing a transfer and a homomorphic uh, encrypt assignments to some um, transactional point. Again, this is hidden transactional point. And the data, the amount is uh, explicit here because this is assets that we do owe. So we keep the uh, original amount and blending key. But when we will be doing a transfer, we will be hiding this part with a Pedersen commitment. And uh, this is the outpoint that we actually own. So this contains the information about transaction ID and uh, blending entropy that we just uh, used here. So basically, and this data are, if we will go into the directory with the data, we will see that here instead we now contain Anchors. This is the transfer first I was doing before the pre demo to make sure that it works. And this is like this one. And this is done right now, 1800. These data are, uh, can be seen in binary format. This is the anchors that links the proofs to the transactions. These are state transitions that are part of our stash. Uh, the genesis blocks for this, they work here originally. And in the cache for fungible assets, we will have 
information about the actual allocations. So that's how the RGB assets are working from a command line. Again, as I said, you have to prepare a partially signed Bitcoin transaction and make sure that you do not misspell any of these multiple values. Uh, the end users will not need to face that uh, all of that difficulties in no way. Basically, it, it will be the wallet software that will be hiding all that functionality. And the actual wallet integration can be done in a pretty much simple way. I will switch the screen to another window. Uh, just give me a second. Here the window. Do you see it? Yes. Yes, yeah, very bad quality though, but yeah. Oh, now it's better. Perfect. So all oh, this part was done by Alecos as well. If we will look into an Android application, we will see that the actual integration of RGB looks like this. We First, uh, runtime where this variable coming from demo app, I assume. Yeah, first we start the RGB node inside mobile application here. We create a runtime providing some information about uh, the local connectivity of the different parts of the demons and uh, contract endpoints. Here we connect only fungible assets, but if you will need to use collectibles or identities, you will just connect a thing per each uh, schema type. And later when we do the transfer, we actually call, uh, here we have an issue because we don't need to provide all that uh, transactions and, and the rest. But uh, with issue, you just call the single command with the parameters about the issuance and it goes through all of the threads inside the wallet and creates all the necessary information. So it's just two lines of uh, the code, pretty much like you do that in command line, but with uh, Java. So I think that's all for the demo. Uh, we probably should tra transfer now to question and answer session. And I don't think that we have time to reassess uh, the fungible asset schema from the last call because it will take more than half an hour at least so probably we will do question and answers and uh, postpone everything else to the following calls yes perfect it's alive so um thanks guys for listening and looking at all this uh regarding the now it's a very good time for q a session and regarding the issues that are still in, in the agenda. If you're interested in participating, I can uh, assign some of them to you in GitHub. So just drop me your handles and I'll join you in some particular issues there. And now questions. Oh, I have one. Uh, thank you very much, Maxime, for the for the demo. F finally, I can see uh, every piece together. Uh, I have. Uh, I don't understand the thing about the final acceptance. So when the the receiver accepted, it, it could check the internal validity of the consignment, basically, but it couldn't really check that the UTXO uh, was actually spent because you. Uh, I mean, we were omitting the part in which you give the witness back to the wallet and sign it and broadcast it on testnet. So the receiver right. right now could check the validity, but not the confirmation. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. I, I said at the beginning of the demo that uh, uh, right now we are not connecting to Bitcoin blockchain or Lightning channel. So this part of validation is not integrated into this build of RGB node. Otherwise, it will be just crazy to do the demo. So we basically trust that uh, the transaction graph is made in the right way. So if you will need to do and integrate it into the wallet or do real uh, real thing, you have to set up BP node. And uh, for that, you need, will need also a Bitcoin core connected. 
and the interface to BP node will be finalized within, I think, the, during the next week. So you will be able to, first you will have to run the BP node to indexing of the whole blockchain, which again will take uh, several hours. And then you will be talking to BP node uh, from the RGB node. Thanks. So uh, here the security model is uh, like uh, like in Bitcoin validity and confirmation in in a sense that uh, the, the 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 demon can already check that the the consignment contains well formed transaction and then you check for the for uh, for double spends basically or uh, uh, so, so so you can say that the transaction is confirmed but you can already say that it's valid right uh the validation consists of three parts and the validation against bitcoin transaction graph either from a uh, blockchain or from lightning network channel is one of these three validations so you can do two others which are validation against uh, of the internal data consistency and validation against schema and schema scripts. But you can't do uh, the validation against Bitcoin transaction graph, meaning that you wouldn't know uh, that the witness commitments are done because you will need information about Bitcoin transaction fees, which can be extracted from off-chain data. And you can't trust those data. You will even if you will save that information, you will need to make sure that uh, outpoints are not spent, the outpoints that shouldn't be spent are not spent, and you can't check uh, that the actual commitments are uh, done in transactions that are part of the state channel and lightning channel or part of the mind longest uh, Bitcoin chain. Sorry, maybe it's, it's a, it's a simple answer to your question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have another question if nobody else has others. You, at a certain point in the demo, you said that there is uh, some procedure that you would like to eliminate because uh, it's crazy and you asked for opinions about that, but I think I unfortunately missed w which was the thing that you were suggesting to eliminate. Can you, can you go over that again yeah. briefly? Thanks. So basically with Bitcoin transactions, I will explain to everybody because Jacob already knows that, but to make it uh, understandable to all of the participants, uh, RGB uses Bitcoin transactions in two ways. The first way is to put the commitments to uh, what happens with RGB off chain. Basically, commit to each uh, transfer. We, we name this transfer state transition. So it, it's more generic than assets only. It works for, it will work for identity and the rest. So you commit to the state transitions into the transactions. And the transaction that contain the commitment, we call it a witness. It is a part of uh, the witness of single use seal witness and so on. The second way you use is that you use unspent transaction outputs to allocate some state to. In, in particular to allocate some assets to this transaction output. And when this transaction output is spent, it means that you actually did a transfer of that asset. And the transaction that spends this output must contain the commitment, meaning that it should be a witness transaction. Uh, we will have more slides on that and presentations in the future because it's quite a complex concept to grasp for. But basically you are using two transactions. Uh, you need a transaction to assign asset to, and you need a witness transaction. And one of the opportunities that uh, came at, in, uh, at head of Alecos and Jacom at the early days of RGB design is that you can basically combine these two things into a single transaction, meaning that the witness transaction may contain uh, an out, uh, uh, output which contains the asset you are transferring to somebody. And uh, meaning that you assign the assets not to existing transaction output, but to the transaction output which will be created by the payer, by the person who pays you. Uh, Giacomo. So the question is, do, do we need this opportunity? Uh, 
because okay, basically understand. i try to re rephrase the, the the question again so uh, one option is i give you the the end point directly and the other the out point directly and the and the other option is instead uh, i give you a normal bitcoin address and you create the out point within the same transaction where you actually uh, uh burn the utx so okay this yeah is but problem. it has two problems because I need not only provide you a valid uh, out point, I need you provide a signed input to that transaction because you're paying me USD tethers, you're paying me asset, assets, you're not paying me Bitcoins. And if I provide you uh, just a Bitcoin address, you need to allocate some of your Bitcoins to that address. And where you will, where you will take these Bitcoins from your own Bitcoins. But uh, I'm not going to pay you bitcoins. I'm going you to pay only USD tether or some other asset. So basically, you have to give me additional to the bitcoin address and signed input in form of partially signed bitcoin transaction, which I will merge into my transaction. Which... Well, now I understand the question better. I think uh, so. I, I uh, open for everybody else to to join this conversation and to and to uh, think say what what they think about this. My personal opinion is that. Uh, the uh, the uh, the scenario in which the receiver creates the out point the, the, uh, gives another out point is a more complex scenario in theory, but it's actually better from many point of view because it's also the scenario in which the the receiver can actually use another independent Bitcoin transaction in order to to further move the asset. So it also allows for less uh, uh, RGB specific on chain footprint. So I think that it's. Uh, it, I, I don't. I cannot see anymore a case in which we need the simple address-based transaction. Probably it was the, the it was a situation from which we started at the beginning, but then we abstracted it away in this uh, 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 UTXO specific uh, model. And I don't. And I cannot see a situation in which we need the, the previous model, which, as you said, is also more complex to manage because you have to uh, to put some some bitcoins fraction fraction in it well maybe i misunderstood something but i i agree with you on on that point that it's easier to do it this way uh but the use case would be somebody who creates an empty new wallet and doesn't have any utxo and wants to receive an asset and in, in this model it has to first uh, receive some some bitcoin and then attach uh the asset to this bitcoin he received and I mean, I agree that that is something that you should do anyway, because sooner or later you're gonna have to pay uh, fees for for a transfer, so you, you probably need some Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, you, it you, doesn't allow. It, it, like Alecos, let's imagine that you're a person who just created a wallet without any Bitcoins. Let's imagine that, and I need to pay you hundred USD tethers. Now, it, it is my obligation not just to pay you 100 USD tethers, but also provide you with some Bitcoins, which I wouldn't do while... No, 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 I, I agree with that. So I, I'm not saying that it's a perfect solution. I'm just saying that there's this issue where you just create a wallet and you want to receive an asset and that's it. And you can't do that if you don't have any yeah. Bitcoin. So I, I think it has a use case. That's it. what I'm saying. Yeah, you cannot receive assets until you, uh, cr we, you have some uh, UTXOs in your wallet. Maybe you can somehow, I don't know, uh, acquire TXOs from, from the external. But anyway, yeah, you, you cannot receive assets until you have some, until you own some Bitcoin. That's an interesting point. But it, it is true in any way. So no matter do we include this ability or not, it is still, you, you have to get the transaction output with the some Bitcoins, where you will get it. Well, you need them yeah. when Somebody you want to spend <laughs> later, right? So. I mean, if you, if, I'm not saying that we should, uh, I'm just saying hypothetically, if we do this thing where you, uh, you, you can basically the address based send. So you can send to an address instead of to a, an existing UTXO. So if we do that, you, you, you can you, receive an asset. You, you, you can, but you can't see to send to an address. Sending to an address actually means that as a payer, I have to create a transaction output using yes. the address you provided me. And this output, must contain some bitcoins yeah yeah uh, all i'm saying is that maybe somebody could like I, I think this is a use case where you say i want to receive some bitcoin plus the asset uh, so you can just receive them and keeping it keep them there so I, I don't know if you like want to withdraw from an exchange 
uh, you can withdraw some assets plus some Bitcoin all in one go instead of having to first withdraw Bitcoin and then withdraw the asset. I, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm just saying that it's probably potentially a use case, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Could I still yeah. receive an asset like for free without Bitcoin and like an empty output and, and still own it and then later receive Bitcoin and use Bitcoin separately to be able to transmit the asset? No, because you, so there's no like concept of an empty output. So you, you can't, well, you could receive to like a zero value output, uh, but then you can't spend it because it's below uh, the dust limit. So. And basically, it will be obvious for uh, chain analysis tools that these outputs are used for RGB. Mm -hmm. Yes. So m maybe, I mean, I understand your point, Alekos. Maybe uh, it, it probably it's clean that the two functions of the of the counterparts are are distinguished. So there is one guy who's sending me an asset, and there may be one guy that is sending me some Bitcoin to enable me to receive asset. Maybe the wallet operator or some some actor like that. Just like when when Bitrefill opens your inbound routing, maybe there is somebody who will give you some free satoshi in order to be able to receive. But that that operation can be considered as separated, even if it's more friction from the wallet point of view. From the pot protocol point of view, it could make sense that they are two separated things. So it's not an, a different way to receive. It's just that before receiving, you can have a separated service service that will create your ability to receive. So, but, but yeah, I understand the point. I think the, the functionality is out there. So you, we have two ways of doing things already in RGB. It's just not in the command line utility that you can do both of them. You can do only one of them with the command line utility, but the RGB node supports both of these options. The only point is just reducing the complexity of RGB. If we don't need one of them, it's easier to delete this part of the system just to, reduced to some level the degree of uh, the complexity that we have. Uh, but uh, from the point of exchange, I, I doubt that any exchange will actually be do that a complex com procedure of simultaneous withdrawal of two different assets from security perspectives and many others. So I, 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 I expect that it might remain the theoretical uh, possibility which will be really hard to implement in, in practice. I mean, well, practice. anyway, I think we could agree that it is not a priori, a, a prioritary uh, feature to have inside any kind of MVP or first, uh, first iteration. But we already have it. Yeah, yeah, we have it in the protocol, but we, if we don't have in it the, in, the in the code, in the code as well. Oh, okay, okay, but but not in the just in the command line interface, which is yeah. Uh, but command line, nobody will use RGB from command line. Uh, I assume. Okay. Um, I, I want to check whether I got lost in the weeds. In the end, we're still going to be able to be the situation where I install a fresh wallet that supports RGB, and somebody else can send me assets without me doing anything. Uh, but I but but there'll have to be some Bitcoin in it. Is that what you're saying? Is that that's that, that's still the normal possible thing, right? You you first have to get some bitcoins. If you don't, but, have I, but I can do it at the same time, like you, as you were describing earlier. Like I can pay you in tether, and and there can be some bitcoin in that process, that, so you can receive the tether. The, the problem the that for, for that case, you need a wallet, your wallet and my wallet, to support that ability, and this will require interactive protocol. Well, no, wait a second. It requires no, an interactive protocol if you uh, basically want to merge the inputs, right? So if the uh, receiver provides an input and the ah, sender... If the receiver provides Bitcoins, but why you will be sending me not only assets, but also Bitcoins? Because yeah, you can do that coins and that's how it works. And I thought that was always going to be at least a limitation to use it easily. But, Jagam, sorry, uh, John, there, there, there are several considerations. I, I will try to maybe simplify that. If you're sending me some assets and I do not have any Bitcoins, we have to negotiate with you that additionally to the assets, you will send me your Bitcoins and I will owe them. Why would you need that? 
but the negotiation is that you you give you you're going to give me an invoice essentially, right? And then that invoice is going to tell me how to properly construct sending you these tether. Um, and and I and if I want to, yeah, you, I can send them to you this way with a little bit of Bitcoin, and, and in such to allow you to not have to allow the receiver to not have to do anything other than provide me that invoice. But that's. Uh... That will make the scheme uh, exposed to chain analysis, at least, at the very least. I mean, I feel like that's a little bit of a separate conversation. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's, I don't know where that, where that lies in the design principles, but like, I, I do think it's going to be a little weird if we, if we launch a, a token on Bitcoin thing where people can't receive tokens. Well, it, they still can't receive tokens without receiving Bitcoin if they don't have Bitcoins and if somebody not sending them Bitcoins. And from the end user perspective, they wouldn't see, does it take two transactions or a single transaction? Right. I'm still a little unclear whether you just don't like that the, the, the use case I'm presenting or if it's actually not possible. Um, I can offer you guys, just to save time, uh, I can open an issue with this question and we can proceed with the discussion in the issue. Yeah, I think I think we need, we need to think more about that because technically yeah. you can do it in different ways. So if you're talking about a uh, user story, uh, if I don't have any Bitcoins, uh, there is always a possibility for you in multiple ways to send me both assets and uh, Bitcoins, notwithstanding which decision we will take on the protocol level. It's only the question of how the wallet should implement such a functionality, creating two different transactions, having an integrated protocol or whatever else. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that this decision affects the user experience anyhow. It affects confidentiality and complexity. That's my assumption as well, I guess. I, 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 that's what I'm asking is I can do that if I want to, right? Like if I want to set up my wallet using RGB to give a receiver the capability to receive, I can create that user experience without, you know, uh, peering requirements. Yes, yes. Okay. The only question, which functionality do we need pro to provide wallet developers to simplify their life at the same time, not increasing the confidential, not damaging the confidentiality or increasing the complexity of the protocol? Yeah, I, I would just say in general, I, I would definitely expect for somebody building a wallet and for a user to, they would expect to have the, at least the capability to receive assets without owning any, um, even if it meant that there was an extra expense for the sender. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's iterate on that together with other issues we have. The next call will be devoted for identity thing, but the call, the one after the next, it will be really nice to have discussion about all this different schema design options and protocol design options which affect the user experience, like having ticker and an asset name in the schema, having the ability to send in the same transaction both assets and bitcoins and other issues. We have just a list of them. Pruning, burning, and the rest. And other germs. So well, at least we're far along and they really, in the end, seem like kind of small issues. They're just decisions. Yeah, yeah, they, they do not affect the code to in large scale. It's technically they are not hard to do anyway. So we already have all of the functionality there except for pruning. And uh, it's more for the most of the issues is just the question of removing some of existing code other than writing a new one. Thanks. So uh, I have another yeah. question. Sorry, guys, if, if I'm monopolizing the questions, this is the last one, and then I will shut up. Uh, also, it's, it's a question that I feel like it was already discussed. So uh, forgive me in advance if, if I missed out uh, the, the the answer. It probably was already somewhere even in GitHub. So when you are using the 32-bit uh, blind factor, uh, uh, are uh, are, you, are we sure that being that the UTXO set is very small? I cannot use the UTXO set 
in order to try all the 32 bit combinations and brute force. So I, you were mentioning rainbow tables and so forth, but is, is 32 bit enough to avoid uh, the, the uh, possibility of uh, brute forcing with, with like GPUs or stuff? Mm, it seems that we had this discussion. Yeah, my memory betrays me. Yeah, it's not it's but, not hard to technically we can easily ex, ex, increase it to up to sixty four bit digits. Uh, the thing is okay. that basically with thirty two bits, like the UXO set is right now in Bitcoin. Let me let me calculate that uh, Bitcoin UXO set. Uh, it's hard to find it instantly, but I don't you remember the order. Part. Well, yeah, yeah, you don't need the size of the two sex, you just need the number of, basically, the number of possible out points to combine, right? But it is basically the size of all the set because it's, you yeah, need right. both transaction ID and the uh, output number. And uh, basically, that's why we need to, to know the size of the set. But with the 32-bit integers, we have 4 billions of uh, combinations per each of the existing UTXO sets. I don't know how many time it will take to hash 4 billions per thing. How long I think it, it depends on, on the hash function, because if it's a normal, like, uh, normal. fast SFA. hash function, it's very, very fast. Yeah. So like, I, I think GPUs are like probably hundreds of uh, giga hash per second or something like that. Not sure, I, I've never mined with GPUs, but uh, yeah, so it, it's, I mean, if you want to use like this kind of hash function, you probably need maybe at least 128 bit, probably 256, um, just like to be safe. Because if the UTXO set is small, if it's like a few thousands, it doesn't really affect like the. Uh... It's uh, not few thousand. It's 65 millions right now. But yeah, it's still pretty small, I would say. So like, if you think in terms of power of twos, you have two to 32 and 65 millions. It's not really that many. Um, it's uh, 65, it's two power 20 something. Yeah, I mean, so I think under 64, uh, under 64 bit, it's really considered easy to brute force. So if you multiply them, you don't even get to uh, to the 64. So it's probably very easy. Two to the 128, probably a bit harder. I don't know. Still, it's not a super. It's not a critical issue because we are talking about uh, uh, right now. We are talking about privacy and not security, and only with the paying party. So basically, the receiving party is giving this information, the the, the invoice, only to the paying party, and it is the paying party who needs to use the GPU to force it. So it's not like uh, uh, chain analysis companies can can try to do that over the whole network. So it's a very uh, it's a very uh, soft uh, privacy point but still if it doesn't cost anything to improve uh, uh, to a it, it, it cost for it cost eight bytes per each historical outputs forever but uh, it increases uh, the size of the ch of chain data the trade is, is is the data of the of the consignments right but yeah. what if the oh, the other option would be to just remove the blinding and uh, like i was thinking about it now the, the point is that when you go and spend the output you reveal everything um anyways pretty much i think because you have to well, spend the output always. somewhere not always it depends on the schema and the validation so if we talk about the generic lightning uh, rgb protocol we uh we, it's the blinding is the part of generic rgb not fungible asset schema so there may be use cases where uh, we don't reveal all of the out points that we have to all of the parties forever. Okay. And also, uh, it's very important because uh, when I pay to somebody, like, for instance, I'm buying something for a million dollars, and it's me having the incentive to attack that party. And it's really important, it's more important to hide the fact of what outputs are owned by the receiver than hide it from all other future owners. You see, because you will own this asset for some time. And when it is in past history, you already spent that asset. You don't have it. Yeah, but the point is, um, I, I don't know. I think I think if, if it's something like very, very cheap to do, so like just uh, a few buys like it is now, 
uh, then it doesn't really hurt to have it. But if you have to really increase the size to make it very secure, because as you said, the, the issue is uh, between the sender and, and the receiver. So you, you want to really protect the privacy there. So if you really want to protect the privacy there, you have to increase uh, potentially the, the size of, of the entropy just to be sure that it can be brute forced. Uh, but then you're paying it. So I, I don't know, like you're paying a lot just to protect your privacy with the sender and not uh, forever uh, for the following like transactions that, that are going to happen later. later. So I, I'm not sure if it's worth it. I, I don't know. I was just thinking about it. Uh, we can also leave it as is now and just you know think about it. And so it's more like for for hundred millions of millions of combinations, according to my estimation, you need to compute. Uh, so it's 52 digits, basically two in power of 52. And, yeah, that's uh, very easy. If it's SHA-256, it's probably very, very easy to do with like a GPU or, I don't know, let me check. I'm just gonna. Not sure. How many exahashes do we have on Bitcoin right now? Well, exahashes is, much more than two to the fifty-two, I think. Uh, let me see. For what it's worth, you know, uh, I feel like we'll, that we'll end up solving privacy different ways. And I, I would, I would have always been okay if RGB was totally the same way as Bitcoin, and you could see it the same way. But anyway, it will be more private. Yeah. Just so I see every privacy thing as a bonus, not necessarily as yeah. something to like uh, redesign the system for. Okay. So one quick like benchmark I found. Um, there's a computer where well, it's probably a pretty expensive computer, whatever. Uh, it can do 23 gigahash per second of SHA-256. Uh -huh. uh, 23 gigahash. And here yeah. we have uh, 400, 4,000. Four and a half thousand gigahash. Yeah, so, so it's it will really take not that many seconds, hours. like one hour. Yeah, one hour, like one hour. Okay. And this is, I mean, then then it depends on how much you wanna be like you wanna go crazy. The point is, this is a GPU. Then you also have FPGAs, uh, like optimized, uh, whatever. So you, you can probably uh, go even much faster. Uh, I'm not saying that somebody is gonna be like an ASIC just to brute force RGB UTXOs, but uh, you can do that. Well, can at least we can, we can we can we uh, can move for entropy from thirty two bits not to eighty six, but to for instance uh, forty eight bits, and we will just add two basically two bytes or no four bytes per out point, but we will achieve the quite strong. I don't know. I, I think I'm just saying we should probably think about it a bit more. I, I think in general, yeah, I agree. You should get to at least two to 128 overall. So mm -hmm. UTXO set times the size of the entropy should be around two to the 128 at least. Mm -hmm. Well, not at least. That, that's probably safe. That is probably enough. Okay, let's file an issue for that and also spend some time. We have time before release. It's not hard to change at all in the code. Uh, another thing I would like to mention on this call is basically the case that I demoed today. It works with both Bitcoin main chain and Lightning network in the same way. So the only difference is which backend you connect, BP node or LMP node. And uh, basically that's the most important part because the, the, this story is works for both on-chain and Lightning network part. The other difference in Lightning Network use case will be that Lightning Node should actually, it's not user who will be initiating the change, it will be a wallet who will be doing that uh, on the user behalf. But again, it doesn't change a lot uh, in terms of, it, it changes the way it should be integrated into the wallet, but it doesn't change the, how, the way how RGB internals and RGB node internals are working. Okay, good. Then we have the list of issues that we need to file. I will do that. And if no one has any questions, I will offer to wrap this up. 
guys. Thank you. It was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.